Beth, so let's, let's get right to it here. So, you know, Lando Lakes is a farmer-owned co-op. We are. It's an extremely challenging time for farmers. I think farmer medium income is the is negative at this point. We've yeah, seen. I think the average was forty thousand, forty three thousand dollars, but the median is minus fifteen hundred. So everybody's living on loans have been for multiple years. It is a challenging environment, and this year especially has been, frankly, it's been devastating for many um, because of the flooding. The weather has been unbelievably challenging. Many. Farmers didn't get planted, and right now, if they did, we're starting onto a hard frost in the upper Midwest. And so the yields, if, even if they got planted, won't be, won't be good. And that's on the grain side. And then on the dairy side, it's been five years where they've been losing money. Um, and so you know, this is, this is the first year. I just started to see uh, milk price pop up a little bit where a couple of them are actually going to make money and that's great because they've been living on their balance sheets. So extreme weather, one factor, what are some of the other issues at play? Well, I always get the question of, you know, trade. Um, certainly that's not been helpful. Um, and that volatility means that a farmer doesn't know when to pull the contract, what to hedge, um, and then you can't understand how to invest. So beans, soybeans um, have been shipping to China for the last number of years. And, um, and this year, uh, and really the last two years, this has been part of the, the trade war, the tariff issues. Um, and uh, you know, so that has been devastating for many bean growers. And then uh, on the uh, dairy side, it's been the disruption with USMCA. The, um, Mexico is the largest dairy market for export. And exports are critical for, again, the most productive farmers in the world, the American farmer. So you seem to view, though, your role as not just improving the business, but really improving the communities where these farmers live. Why is that so important? You know, we are member-owned, um, so we touch half the harvested acres, 25% of the farmers in America, um, with our federated model. You know, the, the reality is, I thought one of the most profound things, one of the board members said when they named me CEO, and they said, Beth, please do something to change this narrative. Um, please make sure that you leverage this moment to do something bigger. And I thought, you know, that's a great challenge. So I've spent a lot of my time, before my predecessor was focused on that grand challenge of feeding a growing world population, 10 billion people by 2050, we have to almost double food production in that time. I decided to pivot and to push back into rural America because we are seeing just devastation in rural America. As people stop and say, oh, it's the trade or it's farming. But understand, if they don't make money, the towns around them have no investment. We have, you know, what is it, 24 million people in America that don't have access to technology to broadband. 19 million are in rural America. There's a shortage of 40,000 doctors in rural America. 78% of the, uh, the counties in America that, um, that index as food insecure are in rural America. These kids are being driven to McDonald's or Dairy Queen parking lots to finish their homework. You know, there's an opioid crisis. Three of four, three of four farmers or farm workers have been directly impacted by the opioid crisis. So I've been pushing back and trying to invest my time on addressing challenges, which I think fundamentally means that we have to get investment in technology in these communities. Otherwise, entrepreneurs aren't going to be there. So I focus a lot of my work on broadband access and pushing policy around broadband in these communities. Great, great. So. Denise, for you, I mean, you you took on your current role at Caterpillar during a similarly challenged time. I think the business was at an all-time low for you. First, why did you take the job then? Mm -hmm. and, and walk us through what was happening. Sure. So I took over uh, as group president in 2016. So we definitely were at a low point in the cycles. And you know, Caterpillar serves not only uh, customers in mining markets, but also in construction and, and energy and transportation. So. At that point, um, certainly uh, the opportunity came with the, where the job came open, and uh, I had a, a pretty steep background in uh, engineering and manufacturing, and just had the opportunity. Spent two decades at GM. At GM, that's correct. And so I had the opportunity to, to take the role, and it was really a, a time where we needed to do some major restructuring of the business. And so we had to take a lot of cost out. Um, and I you know, had a good background in doing that. So it was a great opportunity for me uh, to really take the business to the next level, decide what we needed to invest on for the future and what we needed to cut. And sometimes during those difficult times, 
the best decision you can make is what you're going to choose not to do right. versus what you're, you're going to choose to do. So, you know, we had to make some really difficult decisions. I had to cut a lot of things, but it really ended up working out. And, you know, the, the business has improved dramatically. We've um, really taken uh, our cost structure and flattened it out and uh, been able to grow sales and as a result are in a much better position now than we, we were in 2016. So how did going through that painful period change the company and also change those communities where you operate? Yeah, I mean, we, you know, during 2016, we also uh, had a transition of, of our CEO. And so during that time, we really took a step back to look at the strategy of the company and decide what we wanted to focus on. And, you know, we're in a cyclical business, so really trying to focus on what areas uh, can we grow that are less cyclical so that we can really create momentum and grow the company overall. And so moving towards a services uh, business is really what we wanted to do, and we've really chosen to take that on head on and double our services uh, overall sales. Uh, so that's been pivotal in kind of our whole trajectory of where we wanted to go with the business. And I, I think looking at uh, Look, taking a chance, uh, a step back, is oftentimes really important as you start to really navigate the business moving forward, and we, we chose to do that. You know, the services side, that's one of the things that we're trying to, to figure out, because again, in our model, we, we, have, we probably have 4,000 to 5,000 retail outlets in rural communities. And so the question is, in addition to solving some of the problems, and, and normally those are servicing farmers and with crop protection items or things like that, um, the question is, can we use those platforms to solve bigger problems in those communities? That's what, that's what we're looking on, including the technology access or fresh food delivery, because many places they don't have fresh food deliveries anymore. The maternity desert, so can we set up little clinics? I mean, we're going to look at all of those things to expand the utilization of those, that rural footprint in a different way in a services model that I think will have you know, a, a direct um, you know, ability to impact some of these challenges because there's just no services in these communities. Right, and you've talked a lot about how we need to start listening to the voices in the heartland and sort of the shared destiny between urban and rural communities. Why are we not, why are we, how, why are we missing that connection? You know, when I speak in urban areas about this, uh, the, the optimistic side of me says, you know, people come up to me and they say, we just didn't know. We just didn't know. And unfortunately, this kind of fraught political environment makes it seem like this is a red, blue discussion, and it just isn't. We do have a shared destiny between the urban and rural areas, and these rural, the rural communities need investment, and they're the ones growing our food. And they, you know, the thing is that they don't want to move to the coast. <laughs> they want to be in their towns. They want a vibrant economy. They want the same thing all of us want, education for their children. They want health care access. They want, you know, they want investment. So you know, why, are we, why are we focused on this shared destiny? Because I think people forget. To me, it's a, a food security issue. It's a national security issue because we have one of the most efficient, um, you know, cost-effective food supplies in the world. And if we don't invest, these, these, these towns are rolling up. You know, Three farmers a day are going out of business in Wisconsin, dairy farmers. I mean, that's a heritage dairy state, three a day. And if you go out in the country, it is, it's painful. I mean, it's painful. And as I always say, well, we're not getting back on the wagon and resettling the land, for goodness sake. I mean, we've got to invest now and make sure that we have vibrant economies. And so I talk about the shared destiny because there is a shared destiny. And when I talk about that, I'm encouraged because people say, I just didn't know, and how can I help? We're trying to con have a convening of unusual constituents. So, you know, Jamie Dimon from JP Morgan or, you know, Doug McMillan from Walmart or other major business leaders and people in urban areas who will advocate on behalf of rural communities as well. Because it can't be an either or, it has, a, it has to be a both end. And I'd like to bring other voices in that are unusual, not, you know, are really focused on inner city investment, and I keep saying rural America is the new inner city. You should be very clear about that, and that is what is happening, and so we have to get investment immediately. 
So Denise, your business is very international, but are you seeing some of these conversations happen too in, in some of the local communities where you operate? Absolutely. I mean, I think right now it's a very uncertain time. There's a, a lot happening in the world as far as you know investment for the future, but people are, are a lot of businesses are really uncertain about making those investments, and so they're taking a pause and really making a decision on what to do and what not to do. And as a result, there there definitely is a lull and a, a, just a feeling of uncertainty around the world. And I think that really has impacted a lot of end businesses, especially in the industrial space. Mm -hmm. Right. So talk a little bit about that. How do you manage through uncertainty, right? Because if business is good or bad, I, it's probably easier to make decisions than when you have no idea what's going to happen. Yeah. You know, I think it's it's really interesting as you think about uncertainty. And, and I, I think as, as we navigate through, the biggest a uh, piece of advice that I give is to be as transparent as possible. I mean, it, as you're talking to your employees or you're, or you're talking to customers, it's being open and honest about what's happening in the environment, how that's impacting uh, the business. And then also, I think, um, not only being transparent, but also being very clear about what your intentions are and where you're going um, for the future is, is also important. So what you're going to do, what you're not going to do, and how you, how you communicate that becomes really important. Right. And yeah, I'll tell you, yeah, it is, that is so tough because right now, even before we had these, um, this difficult cycle, um, Agriculture in general couldn't attract talent. So talent, I'd say everybody in the room would say, geez, what's your biggest challenge? It's attracting the right players. Um, and, and now it's especially difficult, and I keep saying, geez, my observation is a lot of these people that came in to start working in the sector were doing it when everything was bright and shiny and everything was up and right, and they haven't been through a down cycle. So this transparency is so important, but also doing, being realistically or pragmatically optimistic. To get, them in, to get them enthusiastic about solving these problems and that life is full of challenges and that is part of the journey. Um, but it's very difficult sometimes to keep everybody um, positive and I think I spend a lot of my time with lunch with Beth or breakfast with Beth or you know, we're trying to encourage the team to get out on the playing field. I say, you know, the game is underway and you need to be out there and it doesn't mean that we're not going to take some hits and that's got to be okay. And I think having people see through, I mean, you're in a down cycle, but you will be back yeah. in an up cycle. So it will end. It's a matter of time and right. you can make it through and that resilience becomes really important. Oh, to be so young that you didn't ever have to see a down cycle. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. But it, it, it does seem like for both of you, you are trying to figure out how to change the business so it, it is not such a boom and bust cycle and, and part of that feels like services are a big piece. What else are you doing to try to make sure that it is not, you don't see such extreme ups and downs? Well, for me, I keep talking to my team about driving variability in our cost structure. Because we have a cyclical business as well, maybe not as heavy on infrastructure as you, but trying to drive and make sure that everything is as variable as possible um, is, is critically important um, to us. And then changing, as I said, the services model um, is, is a focus, but frankly, we have to innovate. You know, We have a unique platform, we really are farmer owned, we go right from the farm all the way to the retail shelf, different businesses. So innovation is so critical and what we spend a lot of time on and investment in is um, insight, analytics, technology, the things that will drive a different um, product portfolio or a different services portfolio and you have to have analytics for that. So we're kind of moving pretty aggressively into um, commercialization of different businesses um, driven by insights. Okay. And without a doubt, it's, it's investing in technology. You know, if you look at really where the future is going and, and really trying to skate to the puck, so to speak, um, it's, it's investing in things that you know the customers are going to value and will help them um, be more productive. Um, with your equipment than they can be with the competitors. And so the only way you can do that is, is to really invest in technology and, and look for the opportunity to be smarter about how you're doing um, that investment. And keeping your cost structure as flat yes, as possible yes. is also the key. You know, what's been fascinating, I've been watching your, your sector a bit, and what, what I hear on the services side is we're no longer an equipment manufacturer. We are a service provider. And I was thinking about this in agriculture. Everybody has kind of equipment envy. Right, their asset envy. Oh, this guy's got a new combine. He's got whatever, and um, so I'm wondering how you're going to move, make a move on that direction because everybody's so attached to their stuff, 
And, um, and then the reality is what you're saying is I'll have a combine there for you or a planter or whatever whenever you need it and here's the service and we'll take care of that. Right. Well, and you take the risk out of the, out of the equation right. when you do that, right? So you're kind of guaranteeing a certain level of productivity with a piece of equipment, whether you're going to license that for a period of time or whether they're going to keep that equipment and you're going to help them be more productive. So there's lots of business model changes that you can um, reflect on and be able to participate in that you never could before. Yeah, I just, all I'm saying is they, they like to, of course, take their picture next to their big tractor. <laughs> they they still like to <laughs> like, this is mine, you know, uh, this is Bessie. Um, <laughs> and so I'm always uh, wondering, you know, whether we can pull away from that and really go to something that is really more variable, which I think is probably, def you know, the way to go. Yeah. Interesting. I want to see if there's questions in the room, but first I just want to go back to Denise and, and ask, you know, are you seeing this talent pro problem as well? Is this an issue in your sector or? Yeah, I mean, definitely, you know, I think the job market is so tight right now. And so to be able to hire the best and brightest and even even to, to get uh, individuals into some of our factories, we are really struggling with, uh, with attracting talent. And so it is an interesting time, even though the economy is uncertain and there's a lot of... Uh, of, of uh, uncertainty in the, in the business environment, on the, the talent end of things, we are definitely seeing a pinch. Right. And so we're having to market ourselves, um, really give people a reason to want to join Caterpillar as a company and be more compelling than we've ever been before. And to be attractive, especially in the female market, is very challenging because you know a lot of females don't identify themselves as being a part of a, a construction or, or mining company uh, provider. So, it's, it's changing that value it's proposition. Bad, it's fun. It is. It's a lot right? of fun. It is. <laughs> That's cool. Do we have any questions in the room? No. Okay. Well, I want to. I want to actually touch on something that you both have in common, which is that you're both from rural farming communities. I'm really curious how that's impacted both your careers and your leadership. I don't know, Beth, if you want to start with that. Well, you know, for me. I come from a very large family in the middle of eight children, um, and you start working early because if you want anything that's yours, you better work for it. Um, you know, I think the, the values that you get in um, smaller towns, the ability to kind of be free and kind of do your own thing. Now, with my own children, it feels everything is planned, you know, everything is kind of cultured and, and edited, and here we're going to make this play date and things like that. And, I think that there's a freedom and some lessons that you learn when you're in a smaller community um, that I think have been, you know, been central to the way I think about um, working hard and trying to achieve different things. Um, I, I'm lucky, I really feel that way, even though I probably grew up as a lower middle class, working class family, I think it's a gift. I always concern myself about myself as a parent because my, um, my job is to say no. Right? That wasn't my mom's job. My mom's job was to say, we don't have it, so you're going to have to figure that out. My job is to say, you can't have it, and that's just a different, it's a different challenge. You'll know this, right? Soon, yes. Soon. True. No, I, I totally agree. I think, you know, there, there's huge value in growing up in a community where you have, where you don't have everything planned for you. And I, I remember growing up and actually walking to school in kindergarten or first grade by myself. Right. I didn't have anyone taking me to school. And in, in the summers in, in high school, uh, you know, babysitting to be able to have money to buy school clothes. Right. And that was normal. And, um, and, and, you know, that teaches you a lot about working hard, about, you know, your sense of, of community and um, growing up and helping others. I right. think that really makes a difference. Right. Right. So very quickly, Beth, 30 seconds, what's the outlook for the Heartland? If we're having this conversation in five years, what does it look like? <sighs> I, I am an optimist, a, try to be a pragmatic optimist. I'm going to believe that there's going to be an aggressive, like 1930s rural electric investment in technology in these communities, that people are going to understand the value um, in, you know, on, on the coast, uh, and that uh, we're, going to, we're going to make a change, and that um, these communities will um, improve their vibrancy and others will move back. And we, do start, we are starting to see that, uh, folks moving back into rural communities, and I'm, I'm excited about that. Beth, Denise, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you.